he can see works by Titian, he can see works by Veronese. We have a great example of Veronese workshop painting in here. And he learns really to start constructing form through color. So that's one of these kind of first lessons that he gets. We think that he probably went to Rome in search of commissions, and that perhaps there we know he was looking at the late Michelangelo and also exposed to mannerism, which was sort of the leading style in Italy at the time. So these were all really formative years. But he doesn't seem to have gained any major commissions for himself in Rome. And we don't know exactly the reasons why he leaves in 1577 at the age of 37 to go to Spain, he doesn't know anybody there, to pick up and leave and go to Toledo, except for the fact that perhaps he thought he could get commissions. It was just at that time that the king, Philip II, was building a huge monastery outside of Madrid called El Escorial. Exactly, I see some of you perhaps have visited there. I have not done that yet, unfortunately. So he hears about that. King Philip II is looking for people to decorate this new monastery with religious paintings. So we know he goes, he swings by Madrid, stays there for a few months, but eventually settles in Toledo and spends the first couple years trying to get commissions both to paint for this monastery and perhaps also for the big cathedral of Toledo, which was the other sort of big commissioner of that kind of patronage at that scale. And then he gets a few paintings and he gets a, a few opportunities, but probably because, again, of this very unique style that he's developed, it's not so easy to swallow. And these big commissions really don't come through. He doesn't get hired as a court painter, as perhaps he had hoped. He doesn't get taken on as a master painter at the <coughs> Cathedral of Toledo. And so what's left for him, basically, is to set up a workshop. And he realizes early on that there is a clientele of highly educated nobles, a lot of theologians, a lot of scholars, a lot of clergymen, who really appreciate the complexities of his style and that he's able to support himself and really fill in the gaps between when he was getting some of these commissions for smaller churches or convents that would come in, but that he could support himself through private production, which is really interesting to think about him as a really practical businessman. Of course, he had to make a living, and he really found himself in this ideal spot at that very moment. So Toledo was the ecclesiastical center of Spain at the time, and this was really when the Counter-Reformation was just getting going. And in response to the reforms that Protestants were making, such as no longer seeing saints as being important, or no longer having confession of sins of penitents, these were principles and values that came to the forefront of the Counter-Reformation, and art was expected really to convey these ideals. And so here is El Greco surrounded by these educated theologians who are looking for perhaps art to put in their home of a devotional nature, and he really kind of struck gold by creating this kind of devotional image of saints, which becomes his specialty. He does them early on. He paints them all throughout his career. And this is one, probably one of the best, one of the most beautiful, of 22 versions of the penitent Magdalene that you end up doing originals, but also the workshop variants. We know ours is original. Not all of them were. He had, again, a lot of artists that were working with him. But it says a lot about the popularity of the theme this idea of the importance of a saint as a divine intercessor, but also of penitence, the sacrament of penitence, of confessing your sins and repenting, essentially, for salvation. So within the genre of devotional images of saints, which were so important to him and sort of became his bread and butter because he had the perfect clientele who really wanted and appreciated his style and also the subject, the subject of the penitent Magdalene you know, was really the summa of, of what he could do. As I mentioned, this is one of several versions and it's done on the earlier side, about 1580 to 1585 is when we think that this was painted. And here's where you're really kind of seeing the quintessential El Greco style. I'll get to that in just a moment. For those of you who may not know the story of Mary Magdalene, she was a reformed public sinner, sometimes described as a prostitute. And for her, her attributes that you see here really tell you her story. She was a saint. Here, El Greco's not painting her with a halo. Instead, he's emphasizing her physical beauty, which would perhaps refer to the fact that she had been a prostitute, but also her really long blonde hair, which was her symbol of penitence. She washed and anointed Christ's feet with her hair, and so that's something that's really being exaggerated, even in this version, earlier versions, her hair is not as long, for example, so it's something that he's really kind of drawing to the forefront to show you. She's shown here with her hands clasped in an attitude of prayer, so it's giving you a sense, too, of her continued service to God and to Christ. And she's shown with attributes that if you didn't see you know, the halo, of course, is not there, and you want to know who she was. There are a few other clues that exist here, and almost a really beautiful still life. In the lower right-hand corner, where you see an ointment jar, beautifully transparent. Of course, he didn't have to paint that in front of the skull, but he chooses to do that to show you his virtuosity as a painter. That refers again to the ointment and to her act of service, her act of penitence. 
You see the skull, which of course is a great sign of vanitas, of mortality. So the sense of, you know, beauty is fleeting, youth is fleeting, and that what's really important is what happens to your soul in the afterlife. And even the ivy has significance, and that it's a plant that's evergreen. So it's something that has a whole cycle of death and also rebirth, resurrection, and renewal. So all of these are sort of pointing to the rewards that one would get if they follow the example of the penitent Magdalene. And of course, she's looking up at ultimately what's her reward, which is this break in the sky of this kind of eerie light that's coming through that gives you a sense of heaven or of some kind of divine presence. So she's looking up at that, it draws your attention. So you as the viewer perhaps will relate to her and think, if I act like the penitent Magdalene, I too will have perhaps this heavenly reward waiting for me at the end. Now, the quintessential style, first I think we should talk about the elongated figure and proportions. If you didn't notice it, now you will. Uh, one of the sort of hallmarks of the mannerist style, and you'll see that in our bronze, you know, who's a component of the style in the portrait that's sort of behind you there on the wall, this idea of elongated proportions, which were seen as really being beautiful, often that you see them in the hands. Here you see that, not just, of course, in her beautiful clasped hands, but in this arm that really extends down. So we get this kind of elegant figure. The fact that she's twisting and looking up, the sense of movement, that was known as a serpentine form, so that was also deliberate. It was really to try to give the figure grace and beauty overall. El Greco was known for his kind of vibrant, crazy palette, and you see it less in early works like this, where it's more cool, but you get a sense of that kind of intensity, and there's something electric about this kind of blue, cool palette that dominates the tones, and certainly the color that's breaking through in the sky. And if you look, you know, on the internet or you look through books, you really get a sense of the range of color that he's playing with. This, you know, example he's actually taking from Veronese and some of um, these Venetian artists. They're almost like popsicle kind of acid colors, which is amazing, but really, really vibrant, of course. So we have the elongated figure, we have the cool color, we have the kind of, you know, electric tones. And one of the things that gives it this intensity and this almost kind of vibrating effect is actually the brush strokes where he doesn't really blend the colors all the way together. It's been described as this kind of flickering color. And I think that's definitely true. So that even though almost all the figures you will ever paint, these two included, are almost expressionless. She's showing a little bit more. But they tend to not reveal too much about what's going on in their faces. They tend to be fairly detached. You still get a sense of psychology. You still get a sense of emotion and presence. And it's really coming through the style and this kind of sketchy brushwork that's kind of coming together, and you'll have to come up and look at it, and trust me, and Scott's going to talk about this, I know, a lot more about um, really the beauty of El Greco's brushwork. But that's all adding to this sort of sense of divine awe. The eerie lighting is another one of El Greco's sort of quintessential style elements, where we know where the light's coming from, it's shown inside the painting, and yet she seems to emanate light herself. She's almost glowing. It kind of gives this eerie quality. And that's something that really belongs again to the manner of school of thinking to which El Greco really belonged, which is this idea that the divine should visually be demarcated. So that in the Renaissance, the period that comes before this, you would see miraculous things happen and painted in a very naturalistic style, and it would look like angels were really just part of the real world around you. Mannerism took it a step further and really wanted to kind of exaggerate that which was divine or supernatural from that which was belonging to the natural world. And there's this great contrast again with this almost hyper-realism of these things that are of our world here in contrast to the saint, the Magdalene, who seems to kind of be otherworldly. So it's these characteristics that have really led a lot of scholars today to kind of cast El Greco in this proto-modernist light, um, calling him a precursor to the expressionist and there is a bit of a difference in saying that, you know, we look at the style and we might think it's expressionistic and it certainly does cause, you know, an emotional reaction in the viewer. But we probably can't say that El Greco was expressing his own emotional feelings about the subject in this particular case. That he really does kind of belong to the thinking of his time, which was 16th and 17th century Italian painters and also the manner of school. But what's different, as much as he belongs to that moment, and really more of his moment than perhaps to ours, is this original style, so that given all of these shared qualities with other artists painting at the time, he still really came up with something that is so unique to him, it's almost unprecedented in the art that comes before him, and even the art that comes after, we can sort of think of a handful of artists that don't seem to come from anywhere, that don't have a clear predecessor, and he also didn't leave behind any school. There was an artist that would really pick up on after that, he had a workshop, his son worked with him, and he to make 
paintings as the El Greco workshop after his death, but after that, no one picks it up. So it's this kind of fascinating figure that I think continues to enthrall us. So we're talking about El Greco as a master painter, but also someone who's practical. He has to support himself, and he has his workshop. So I mentioned that the single things like this were really part of his specialty, and it was something that he would produce throughout his career. But the other side of the production that was just as important, although a bit smaller, was that of portraiture. So we're really lucky here at the Nelson Atkins that we can show these two sides of his production. And portraiture is actually how he was really known in his own time. It was the one area where people felt, I think, more free to admire him, because he did kind of have to stay a little bit more closely grounded in reality. Now, this is a portrait we have of an unknown Trinitarian friar, and it shows a lot of the characteristics of most of El Greco's portraits. Most of the people he painted were actually friends, again, in this close circle of theologians and clergymen and intelligentsia. So it really gives us sort of a sampling of the types of people that he was you know, interacting with in Toledo at the time. This being an exception, we don't know who the particular sitter was, but it, it does show the kind of composition that he typically created when doing portraits which was to shift the emphasis onto the face of the sitter by removing any detail of the setting of the background. So almost all of them have a really solid color background or just something like this that's incredibly vague. You assume he's sitting inside, he's sitting in a chair, for example, but you don't get any other details, and that's something that all of them will share. Here, the palette is much more muted. Of course, it's going to be conveying this person, flesh tones, and the robes. We know his order, the Trinitarian order, because of the shape and the colors on the cross. He's holding spectacles, by the way. I know that sometimes it can be confusing. I had to spend time with it before I finally realized what it was. It gives you a little bit of a clue that this is somebody who spends his day reading, that perhaps he's a scholar, there are sort of spectacles coming out of the case. We do have some sense of the time in which this portrait would have been painted. It was done, unlike this piece, which was much earlier in El Greco's career, really towards the end. It was done, we think, around 1609. He dies in 1614. His style really evolved over time and tended to become much more abstract and much looser. We don't see that in this particular portrait, probably because it was done almost like an anthropological study. We know that around 1609 that there was another friar that's documented that comes to visit him in his studio. His name is Friar Hortensio Paravicino, and El Greco was so fascinated by the contrast of his gaunt face with this really robust body, which is kind of a funny description. And if you see the painting, which is today at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, it's really wonderful. It's very similar to ours, although it goes down to the knees. You don't get a sense of this kind of early, robust body, but he was really interested and fascinated with this contrast of a man who he thought would just be kind of emaciated, more ghost-like, someone who you might associate, you know, of course, living in the cloister. And he asked permission from the friar superior if he could make a copy of him. That's a really direct quote of El Greco, which is an interesting way of thinking about what a portrait could be. And it's, it's very realistic in that sense that he was trying to capture really someone's physical likeness. We don't know the circumstances in which this was done, but they're wearing the exact same costume, and they're sitting in the exact same chair. So it gives the impression that perhaps two of these friars made his acquaintance around that time, and that he was able to get permission to paint them both, and that the interest for him here, he's not making this for a patron, the friar probably wouldn't have had money to purchase this from him, that this is something the artist is probably making for himself, perhaps knowing also that there might have been a buyer that would have been interested you know, in having it later. Here we do get a sense of the sitter's psychology. It's not as pronounced as we see in many of the other portraits. But there's something really stirring, and again, he's not making any expression. So all of that feeling that we're getting and looking at him comes a lot through this gaze, this kind of matter-of-fact stare, but also comes through the brushwork. And those of you sitting in the front can really see that there's a vibrancy that happened in the drapery that you wouldn't necessarily expect. It's almost more lively in some ways than the faces. But it's these areas of unblended color once again, and it creates this kind of vibrant texture on the surface that, again, just kind of has this almost buzzing quality. You get that also with the hands, that they're not elongated, you know, we don't have that kind of mannerist exaggeration, but they're greatly simplified, and they almost look unfinished, and it gives a sense, again, that perhaps he's stirring, or that he's going to be speaking to us almost more than the face itself does. So I spent a lot of time giving you some background, getting you warmed up, thinking about the context of El Greco, and giving you some information about our two incredible masterpieces here. So I'm happy to hand it over now to Scott. By the way, remember the name Paravicino? Because we're going to come back to that problem a little bit when Scott talks to you about the treatment he did on the friar. But I am going to hand over the actual mic, I think, to Scott, who's going to continue our talk.
I may use this because sometimes my voice doesn't, you know, carry for the full period of time. Um, but we're kind of delighted to put this program together and have Nikki and I share it uh, because as the art historian and conservator in the museum, we kind of work hand in hand throughout just the whole place, all of these projects. Um, and I uh, have the great privilege of restoring both of these paintings and this restoration represents two and a half years of my life. Both of these treatments were incredibly complicated and difficult. Um, and I've been here, I'm embarrassed to say, 30 years, a little over 30 years. And really, these two paintings are my most challenging treatments. I mean, I've worked on the Caravaggio, the Rembrandt, the, you know, the Sargents, lots of the, the Bronzino, that's right, <laughs> and Titian, and so on. Um, but I'm, I want to, we have a short amount of time, and so I want to sort of take you a little bit through the two restorations, not blow, blow by blow, because there isn't a time for that, but kind of just some of the things I discovered uh, about his working technique, uh, things I discovered about myself. Uh, as you're working on a very complicated project, uh, you learn in all kinds of different directions. Um, the first treatment that I did was the friar, uh, and one question that often comes up is how do you decide what to treat and what comes before what else and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and Ian Kennedy, the curator at that time, uh, and I uh, were aware that this was an important painting in our collection. It looked very dull, it was very uninteresting looking. And uh, whenever there were El Greco shows throughout the world, they would often invite this one, never invite this one. Uh, and you know, that doesn't bother us, but it, it just did not look as it should have. So uh, we talked about it, and I, we knew it was going to be a very challenging project. Um, and I said, yes, I'm happy to do it. Uh, well, quite as simple as that, but it works that way. Um, and the first thing you do, and we'll get, go into details, is a very thorough examination to really find out what's going on with the work before you start. And there's a lot of documentation. Uh, we may take x-rays, take samples for cross-sections. Uh, we do all kinds of photographs, write reports, everything to move into the restoration. And as I was doing that with this one, I discovered, or I knew ahead of time, but I knew that this entire section of the background was completely overpainted. And in fact, uh, when I studied it further, it turned out that there were many layers of overpaint on top of that, completely covering El Greco's background. And it turns out what happened um, sometime hundreds of years ago, you know, maybe even less than 100 years after this was painted, in the monastery, in the religious order where this painting stayed, uh, someone painted white paint over the background and wrote a religious inscription in black letters. And the, the white paint that they put on was lead white, you know, the, uh, the typical white pigment during all this Renaissance period and even later is a lead white. Well, what that means is that it becomes very hard with time and absolutely impossible or difficult to take off. So, uh, as part of our treatment, we took an infrared photograph of uh, that background. Now what infrared photograph means, imaging means, we can use this instrument to shine infrared light and, and the light will go into the paint and be absorbed by any black pigment that's there and then it reflects through the other colors of paint and you can capture that in an image. So this photograph, yeah, I'm thinking this kind of, you can see, and I'll move you a little bit, okay great. Uh, here's his shoulder. It's a little over life size. So this is the background. And you can see in the infrared image these, these letters. Uh, they're pretty clear. Um, and they're Latin, most likely. Yeah. Oh, cool. So cool. this is where our history and conservation starts to really get interesting when a problem like this comes up and it's given to the art historian and start exploring, you know, what does this mean? What could it mean for the meaning of the painting? I am not someone who knows Latin, 
nor am I someone who necessarily has a great deal of 17th century Spanish, but I called in the big guns and actually worked with brothers at the Conception Abbey and asked for some help in identifying, is this Latin, is this Spanish, what is it? So if you turn this, this way out, if you don't mind, this is the orientation actually in which this inscription was written, and we see that there are some words that repeat. And with their help, we think now that this says charisma, charisma. This, we're not really sure at the beginning, but it ends with the C-I-N-O, C-N-O. And then here, another M-A, perhaps another charisma. And this is duyento, probably missing a letter, al duyento. And what we think that this translates to is actually Lent and Advent, which are the two liturgical seasons. But what comes really interesting, and I can't pretend to have a resolved answer for you here today, is the possibility of what could have been preceding the C-I-N-O. Because remember our brother, Fry Hortensio Paravicino? Well, he writes a book with these words in it. I'll read you the title. Orationis Evangelicas de Adviento y Clarisma. And I wonder, and this is just a question that we're just starting to scratch on, is was this a case of mistaken identity? Did somebody, at some point in this history, and I know Scott, you might talk about the fact that your investigation seems to indicate that this might have been added very early on, probably didn't stay there too long before somebody covered it up. I wonder if somebody thought, hey, we have this great portrait of the Friar Hortensio Paravicino. He wrote this book, came out in 1636. Maybe we should just inscribe this so everybody knows who this illustrious sitter is. Maybe somebody told them they were wrong. They had to cover it. So this is just the beginning of our investigation. I find this absolutely fascinating. And it's just another clue, perhaps for us, that might turn into other things the more we share this with other art historians and scholars of the period to help us perhaps fill in the holes. So this is a, this is like breaking news. Nobody else knows that. Well, you know, it's all discovery. Uh, you know, this painting has been in the collection since 1952. and. Right now, we're learning more and more about it, uh, and we have more to learn. And that's exciting about really all of these paintings and artworks here in the collection. So, uh, bad idea. Uh, big black letters on a white background on that side of the guy. Uh, so, in, probably in the monastery, they, so the next guy in charge came by and said, that's bad. So they painted brown paint on top of that. And then uh, the painting came into the collection uh, it received some restoration by a predecessor of mine, and he did not try to take that off for good reasons. Uh, and he put some more of his paint on top to sort of camouflage the whole mess. Um, thank you. Uh, well, okay, that ruins this painting, and that's why it just looks so bad. It just had a horrific, heavy brown color on that one side. So as part of my testing, um, I, I wanted to take that off. Uh, and I used different solvents, different solvent mixtures, gels. We have a lot of science to work with to help to try to take that off. And there is no combination, combination of chemicals would successfully take it off without taking off El Greco's very thin paint that was underneath it. Um, and in fact, someone tr tried to test this at some point in its history. And right around here, they use solvents, kind of a you know swab motion oval, and they went right through everything, right down to the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad that no one tried to take it off. And I tried different things, and I found that if I sat with a really good microscope, binocular microscope, so I could see in three dimensions, and a scalpel, mm -hmm. I could carefully scratch off that overpaint and not hurt the original of those underneath. And that was literally millimeter by millimeter. Um, and I had the entire background to do. That took, that took eight months. I mean, that took you know, months and months. Um, and people say, well, how could you do that? And I go, I don't know, but I kind of liked it. <laughs> well, I'd get up and you know, do something else once in a while. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, what it shows, and you can see this, and I probably would like to help, um, you know, see that is. Uh, this painting is an amazing painting. Um, it's very late in his career. In fact, actually, the scholars in, in, at the Prado Field is, is done in 1614. Yeah. Uh, and the, paint, the whole painting is done <coughs> on a red ground. 
So here you see the dark, it's like a brick red. So he painted the entire canvas brick red. Then he painted the portrait. And he used that brick red showing through his paint to create this, this feeling. And when it came to the background in this very late modernist kind of brushy, he, he was in, you know, at the top of his game. And uh, it just really just brushed to create electricity and, and metallic <coughs> to the background with very thin paint on top of the red. And you can see that the red is showing through. The red is showing through. And all of that sort of dashing brushwork is his work that was beneath the thick layers of overpaint. Um, and it took all the time to take that off. Um, it's also interesting uh, when, we look, when we look at his uh, white garment, uh, the cross that's so prominent. At one point in the past, uh, again, in the monastery, it was inappropriate for, for this <coughs> to have this insignia. They somehow painted that entire insignia over with white paint. You know, these things happen. And uh, before it came into our collection, somebody had taken that off. And, you know, down the middle of the day, there's been not a huge amount of damage. And I found remnants of the white paint all in little spots over the cross and, and on his white garment, and I took the rest of that off. Uh, in the treatment, my goal was to take off everything that did not belong to El Brego's hand. Uh, and there were various generations of restoration that I had to take off, uh, you know, to get back to his original work. And that was really the big case here as well. Um, but the, the uh, white garment, I think, is really exciting. Because essentially, he is so confident with the brush, he's using the brick red background and essentially almost pure white paint. And the way he scrubbed it onto that red is he was able to create folds, a three-dimensional quality, you know, an exciting feeling, uh, all by scrubbing white paint onto dark red. He used a little color to help with the shadows, but otherwise it was just direct white paint. Um, and uh, Nikki pointed out the hands um, are very expressive. And, and, some, and people have, when, they, when I was working on it in the studio, would come up and say, well, the hands aren't very well done. Well, at this point, he's, he's exaggerating the hands to create the feeling of power and electricity and other worldliness and so on. Um, so he, he's very purposeful about how he's doing those hands. Uh, the uh, black garment, again, very thinly applied black paint on top of the red. And he's allowing the red to show through the black uh, in the way that you see to, to help give it a feeling of glowing. I mean, it, essentially, the, the garment is kind of glowing on top of this center. Um, the face is spectacularly painted. And Ian, uh, the former curator, was just thrilled with that. And when you look at that uh, and you think of the Impressionist Manet, uh, they're interchangeable almost. Uh, his use of paint uh, it must have been very exciting to Manet uh, and the last kids before him and others as well. And he goes to Toledo. He's, right. one the, he's one of the first of the 19th century artists to start reviving, you know, the master. And it takes a while for everyone to catch up, so you're right there. Um, and uh, you know, so this is a very exciting thing. And the painting that uh, Nikki referenced in Boston is a spectacularly important painting. Um, and when I had this, uh, this um, went to the uh, an exhibition in uh, 2012 in Dusseldorf where they had El Greco and early German modernism. And I went to lunch. This we were hanging it that day. And I went to lunch and came back. And um, the curator, the, the master curator of El Greco from the Prado, was sitting on the floor beside our painting two pages of no, she had never seen it in person before. And she's the one, and I said, we think it's uh, uh, 1609 because it relates to the Boston piece and they have, they have documentation that dates it to that. And she said, oh no, this is much later. Um, she feels it was one of his last paintings because it's, it's so freshly and freely painted. Uh, and when I looked at the Boston piece, um, it, in Bo at the Boston piece, they kind of covers up all the ground pretty much. And here, he's letting the ground show through big areas. Uh, it's also interesting. Here you go. 
he's painting the chair, there you go, and he's painting the side of the chair with one big wide brush of black paint. And he comes down, and then he sees, oh my gosh, if I keep going, I'm going to run into the jacket. And he stops. And you see, the end, when, you know, later, come up and look at it. The end of that brush stroke, it, he just, it's a dry brush, he goes, like, and stops. Um, because if he kept on going, it would confuse the show and all of that. Uh, but you can, if you really come up and look at the painting, you can see, you know, how the artist has applied the paint. Now, this particular piece is signed. Uh, it's signed right across the, the uh, arm of the chair. Um, and as Nikki pointed out, the same chair it was used uh, in the Boston piece. But I mean, they probably had a whole set of them in their dining room or something or like that. Studio. Or perhaps. Yeah. Um, uh, but there are mysteries with these things. We saw, well, we learned things and we know we learn, need to learn more. So this was the first one I did. Uh, it probably started about four and a half years ago or so. Um, and then I didn't work on a complicated treatment for a while, I worked on some other things. And even during the year and a half, year and a quarter that I worked on this, I worked on other paintings. Uh, and we have a million things going on up in conservation. But then I did work on uh, different paintings between the two. And uh, Ian and I uh, said, well, the Magdalene, which has always been popular, was in great need of restoration. And was I willing to take on another very challenging project? And the answer was yes. I mean, I learned a lot from the Friar. And even though this is a different period, it's still the same artist. Uh, and I, I examined other paintings throughout the world uh, by El Greco in, as I worked on this one. And it really was wise to move on to the next one, even though it was a really challenging project. Um, so I started that. Uh, and. Then, just as I was starting, I hadn't really gone too far, the show in Toledo uh, uh, came up, and uh, we were invited to then both to the show, and I uh, was asked if I could finish in time, and I said, you know, I thought I could, uh, you know, it was almost a year. Uh, and then as that year went on, and it was so complicated, when the actual show day came, I, I just couldn't finish it in time. Uh, it was last year, as Nikki mentioned, it was the uh, 400th anniversary of Alberto's death. So a big celebration, especially in Spain and especially in Toledo, his hometown, mm -hmm. uh, second hometown. Um, and but they were having several shows on El Greco, and they were very happy to sort of feature it in their fall show. So it was able to go and, and be a highlight in their fall show, and not the spring show. This turned out to be the highlight in their spring show. Um, it had a very prominent hanging uh, location, and uh, this was a highlight in their uh, fall show, so we had really good representation there. Now this, as, as Nikki pointed out, this painted around 1614, this painted around 1585. They're both high points of different parts of his career, and it's thrilling for us to have them. And this is, I've never seen them together, so this, I think, for all of us, for several months is really kind of a treat to see them side by side. Um, now the Magdalene had other problems. Uh, her problem was a major overpaint. She was very badly abused in previous cleanings and perhaps they took place hundreds of years ago. When you think about it, you know, now we have all kinds of solvents. We have chemistry and science and everything to help us work through treatments. A couple hundred years ago, they had lye, they had turpentine, they didn't have much in terms of materials or even expertise. They didn't have the internet to share ideas or phones or any of that. And someone, maybe more than one time, cleaned this and cleaned it with very harsh materials. Lots and lots of damage. Um, and I, so my goal, as I mentioned here, is to remove everything that's extraneous, that's not Albrecht's work and then build it back uh, from that. So my first pass of cleaning, uh, this one had been restored by uh, a predecessor uh, in 1940. And I had his documentation, all the materials he used, so I knew how to deal with that. And his restoration, which was very kind of over-restoration in terms of the retouch, came off pretty easily with solvents. So that, that 
getting the 1940 restoration off was not real difficult. Uh, easy to say, you know. <laughs> it's, it's a little hard. Um, but then I had to deal with all this. I don't know when it was put on, but oh, again, hundreds of years ago, this is a 400 plus year old painting. Um, and I went back to the microscope and I just carefully could tell what was his work and what was not his work. And I would scratch and remove uh, what was not his work and leave his work. Um, and that was a very good thing to do. Uh, I found that, um, for instance, in her hair, you see these sort of highlights, little flecks of really bright yellow, gold in her hair. Well, someone who was restoring it just was overexcited by that. He just put a lot of, you know, just put any wisp, lots of wisps up here, uh, you know, different things like that. Um, but what I want to do after I removed, and it, again, it was another six or seven or so months of working with the microscope to get all that old, old restoration off. But then when it was completely cleaned down to the only El Greco state, this is a photograph of what, the way the painting looked. And I'm going to, you know, maybe I'll hold it for a minute and then pass it around. Uh, you can see a big line here. That's all the way across here. At some point, the painting had been folded. You know, she just got folded over, and, and it wasn't a tear, but there was paint loss all along that line. This other line is, is a, where a tear was, and there are a couple other little tears. Uh, but the sort of reddish color showing through all over the surface, that's where they took off all of his paint and all of the ground down to the actual water canvas. Um, it's easy to see in the arm. The black spots, you know, and that's down to the raw canvas as well. Uh, lots of loss through that sheer scarf. Lots and lots of loss through the, the clouds. And I'll, you know, while I'm talking, I'll just pass this around, and you'll have a chance to see it up close. Um, so, you know, how do I start uh, restoring something like this once I've cleaned all of the uh, excess restoration off? I started, in this case, with her white garment. Uh, I sort of start where it's a little easier. Uh, I don't do what my mother always said, do the hard part first, get it out of the way. You know, I start where it's easier because uh, I want to learn how his handling of the brush works. Uh, and I can do that where I can really see how I knit the parts together. Now, when I talk about this, what that means is I'm mixing my own paints and I'm matching his color with a tiny little sharp brush only where the loss is. And when you see the photo, you'll see there are lots of losses. But I'm kind of, you know, knitting together, just matching the color, and then, then it bridges that gap, and, you, and the brushwork then comes out. When you have a chance to come out and look, um, the way he's handled this white garment, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it, it's very painterly. Again, you know, it, it's modern. You know, we modern people think we invented modern, but I don't know if that's true. Uh, so I started working in the white, um, and then I, I was also working in the sheer scarf. Uh, and you know, he's very clever about creating that sheer scarf. Uh, it, I mean, it, it looks like sheer silk. You're looking right through it, and I had to be very careful to be just pay attention to knitting the damages together. Uh, and then his, his genius comes through. Um, again, you know, really lots of damage everywhere. Uh, the flesh is tricky. There were big losses in the flesh, and it's so smoothly. Now, when you look at the photo, her face is less damaged than her arm. And that's because the arm is more thinly painted. The face is actually very thickly painted. Um, and uh, it's mostly black white which has a real strength and resistance to solids. So it's pretty hard and, and solid. Um, the arm is also lead white, but it's more thinly painted. It just you know, received more damage. Uh, and it's tricky to get to in paint only where the loss is and, and have it look 
completely smooth and effortless as he painted it. Uh, the one thing that it, I'd like to mention along with what Nikki was saying, it is a subdued palette, but it's got an enormous strength because he's, he's really playing a, a color complementary game. There's a lot of blue. There's a lot of blue in the sky. Her mantle is blue. And then her, there's a lot of orange, a lot of gold. Her hair is golden. You know, her flesh has a, a slight orange quality. And blue and orange are complementary colors. And so even though he's used them in a subtle way, it, it creates a lot of punch. Uh, and it works. And I, spending so much time with the painting, uh, you know, towards the end I'm thinking, oh my gosh, look at that. You know, it's, it's really a composition of orange and blue. And that's why it, one reason why it's so powerful. Um, then when I moved up into, well, when you look at the photo as it goes around, uh, and we only have about five more minutes, so it probably needs to move. Um, <laughs> there's an opening in the sky, in the clouds, and right now that's what you see. But as you look at the photo, originally El Greco painted an array of light coming through those clouds, aimed right at the Magdalene, and she was looking at it. And an earlier version of the Magdalene, which looked quite different than this, it's in uh, Budapest, Hungary, uh, he actually had an opening in a cloud and, and a ray of light coming through. He painted it that way, fully painted it. Um, and then he, he decided it was too overt. It was too, you know, direct a statement. So he painted blue, painted over that ray of light. And as I was restoring it, the ray of light was there, it was revealed because someone took off so much of the original paint on top of it. And, uh, you know, look at this paint with a very good quality microscope, and I showed our conservation scientists from the Mellon Foundation, uh, set up by the Mellon Foundation, and we agreed that uh, it is El Greco's paint in islands on top of that ray of light, and his intention was to have it covered. And so, you know, I had to bring it back to the use of pulling those fewer islands of paint together to cover that ray of light. And now, you know, the strength of the subtlety, you know, is very effective. Uh, in this painting, which is done 15, 20, 25, 30 years earlier, he's a little less sure of himself, although you wouldn't say that looking at it. He painted this ear in three totally different locations. You know, he, and you can see that in the photo going around. You know, the, the ear was a good half an inch over to the right at one time. It was a little higher and to the right at one time. And then he moved it over and bingo, he got it right. He got it where he wanted it. Uh, the ray of light was another major change. Another interesting change, uh, you can see with this really strong light, there's a bit of a hint of a, a lighter color here. And when you don't have the strong light, you know, you don't notice that. Well, he's painting the, the, the composition and, you know, there, she's at the mouth of a cave, and that's part of the iconography. And he's got the highlight, you know, this is moonlight, so he's shining on the rocks and highlighting along the edge of the rocks. And he thought, well, maybe I'll put some rocks down here. And he, and he put two dashes, pretty strong light colored dashes of, of paint there. And he just a feel that that was going to work. Um, and he said, no, don't like it. So we covered that uh, with the dark brown paint. Um, and when, again, when you're sitting there, and it's a, <coughs> you know, the, just having a single diagonal uh, created by the light reflecting from the mountainside uh, is stronger, you know, and it, it plays this diagonal against this diagonal, and it's just amazing. Uh, and, you, you know, this is, sort of the earthly side of things and through the Magdalene we're going up to the ethereal heavenly side you know so that the direction is purposeful in this way um, another uh, part of the restoration that was really tricky the paint in the dark parts of the clouds here uh, is much thinner very thin and when you see the photo it's just really damaged badly damaged and I, I did this part last uh, and I had you know just had a hard time figuring out 
what I would recommend in that area, and I took it step by step, and I knitted together the ground color first. Now, the ground in that painting is a brick red. The ground in this painting is a brown, darker brown. Uh, it's almost not quite as dark as, as up here. Uh, so it's dark, but a different color. And I, I realized that I had to knit together the entire ground in this area. And then, which is how the record started on the round canvas, then he had just very thin wisps of blue paint on top to create that night, that, a night cloud that you don't even know if clouds there, but it's there, that kind of feeling. Um, and I, then on top of that, I knitted together the, the very thin wash of blue uh, to make it the right, right effect. Uh, now, in museums, it's always interesting. Um, uh, just a quick last comment on framing. Uh, the frame that we bought this painting in 1952, and we acquired this one of our very first purchases in 1930. Um, it was the 35th work of art that the Nelson bought, as a matter of fact. Um, and the frame that was on the fryer was similar to this, only bigger. It had corner elements that were gold, and then the feel of the frame was black. And it was appropriate frame for a painting of this type, um, and a good frame too, but it was just, aesthetically, it was just so overpowering, it was just hugely overpowering, and uh, Ian and I, you know, both aesthetically felt that the frame was just not right, and so he researched it, and this is a period appropriate to this period Spanish frame that he bought from a dealer in London, uh, and they sized it to the exact size we wanted, uh, and it's, you know, it's just much more exciting, these, these sort of like diagonal electricity features. Uh, and it's simple so that, that you can really concentrate on, um, you know, the subtlety of the figure and, and really what's going on there. This frame Roger Ward uh, bought for this painting, um, probably back in the 90s, uh, and probably from the same expensive one than the other. <laughs> Uh, and it's never been cut down, it's a Spanish frame, it's everything, and it's so close in size to this, but you know what, it ends up covering about an inch on this side, and that kind of drives me crazy. <laughs> you know, this cloud finishes, but you can't see that, and over here it covers about a half an inch, and the cheek of the skull is, is painted underneath the frame. Um, but, uh, you know, these things happen. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to make sure there was time for questions, uh, and we, we will have to, we, we had such a strong response, and we're thrilled with that, that we added two of these talks, uh, and we have a second group coming in at seven. Um, but we have time for some questions for Nikki and I. So, so actually, folks, before we start questions, as a courtesy to folks who are coming in, we want to take a seat for that transition, what I would recommend if, if Nikki and Scott are comfortable with this, maybe if you have some specific questions, maybe coming up and freeing up some of the seats so we can start seeing folks for the 7 o'clock. really appreciate it. And, and absolutely, thank you, Scott, for sharing this.